Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my Code to Care uh, video series. Uh, I uh, rotate through education topics, uh, use case topics, and uh, bias, safety, ethics kind of topics, and I'm back on my education rotation. Uh, the last education video I did is, what is RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation? And that had way more video viewers than any other topic that I've done. Uh, and a few of you commented that you'd like me to go a little bit deeper into the topic or not just be theoretical, but just show you how it actually works. So I thought I'd do a different kind of video, one that intersperses uh, some of the lightboard stuff here with some coding so you can kind of see how RAG actually uh, works. So I'm going to do this in three different segments. Uh, and if you um, watch my RAG video first, because I'm going to assume you watched uh, that so you can follow uh, this one, but we're going to dive into this concept of a prompt before the prompt in three different stages. So the first stage is, let's say you have a user and you're a health system and you want to provide a patient chat bot uh, that allows your patients to ask you questions. So they might ask a question, do you have parking? Something like that. And you have the prompt uh, and then you have the large language model that uh, returns an answer to that prompt back to the user. So the first thing we're going to do is just a pass-through prompt. We're going to take literally what the user says and pass it on to the large language model and get a response back. So that, um, that in my prior diagram was just that bottom area where we just pass the user's prompt, do you have parking? to the large language model and see how it responds back. So let's go to the desktop and take a look at what that uh, looks like in code. So what we're what you're looking at here is an environment called Jupyter Notebook. And this is the environment that most data scientists will use and machine learning people will use to do simpler experimental kind of programs like, uh, like this. So the way it works is you have code cells, and when you run a cell, so I'm going to run this cell, uh, it will basically execute all the code, and then if there's anything to display, it'll display it right underneath the uh, the cell. So it kind of intersperses code with, with output, which is a nice environment for this kind of work. Uh, this first cell is not doing too much. It's importing a bunch of libraries, um, which will be used uh, uh, later. So we're going to do a simple pass-through prompt, and the prompt I chose is just something you might ask chat GPT. What temperature should I, should I set my house on? Should, <laughs> what temperature should I set my house on vacation so the pipes don't freeze? So that's the question. So if I run that cell, it sets this string into this variable, and then it'll display uh, the value of that variable. Uh, and this is how you call um, uh, ChatGPT in particular. Most of the models look kind of like this. You, um, there's some uh, API uh, here. You pass the model name that you'd like to use. I'm using the um, the fast, uh, cheap one, GPT-3.5 Turbo. Um, and basically, I'm asking the question here. And I'm the role of the user, and the content of my package is this uh, this question. So if I do that uh, in the second or so, uh, it comes back from ChatGPT um, and it has a bunch of uh, parameters and attributes and stuff like that. But you can pull out the actual response um, by uh, this code. The first choice, the message attribute, the content attribute of that message. It's recommended to keep your house temperature at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So that was just taking that question and then passing it through over to ChatGPT and getting a response back and displaying. All right, so that was pretty straightforward. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to add one layer of prompt before the prompt, and this is just extra instructions. So in my prior diagram, I drew it here, where you might add instructions before you send to the large language model, like answer the question as if you're a contact center specialist talking to a patient or answer the question at such and such reading level. Or if the patient asked the question in Spanish, answer the question in Spanish. Or um, use this kind of style. We, we want a folksy style at our health system, so use a folksy style responding back. So the user doesn't see that. They just see their question. But you have added a prompt before the prompt with some instructions, 
send that to the large language model. Let me add this arrow. Uh, and then got a response back. So um, so that's a really light prompt before the prompt. So let's take a look at what that looks like in code now. So I'm still going to use that same question. Uh, but now I'm just going to um, add a little bit of instructions here. And you can see the way this is done in this API is that you're telling the system what it is doing. And so the system, you want, you're saying you are an, you are an assistant who is helping answer questions, please answer as if you're talking to an eight-year-old. Uh, so I wanted to just give, you know, something that we might be able to identify as an instruction. So if I do this, uh, and then show the response, when you go on vacation, it's a good idea to set your thermostat, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so this temperature is cool enough to save energy, but warm enough to keep the pipes from getting too cold and possibly bursting. So you can see this was written for, um, you know, for a child. And you could do other sorts of things. Please answer in poem, at, in, in a poem, something silly like that. And we'll see how it does. When Actually, let me print this. So the new lines come out. When you leave your home behind and worries of frozen pipes fill your mind, set your thermostat to 50 degrees. Interesting, it gives a slightly different answer. Keep your pipes, uh, pipes safe with ease. Da, 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 da. Um, so you can see that um, you can give it commands. It's a little bitty prompt before the prompt in this case, and that will adjust um, the way it will answer your question. So that's not quite rag yet, but that's just showing a little bit of prompt before the prompt work. The user still thought they were just saying this, uh, but you are supplying more information in your code uh, beyond what the user said um, to give a particular response that you may uh, that you may want. Okay. So now what we're going to do next is retrieval augmented generation. All right, so now we're going to do the real RAG stuff, the real ro ro retrieval augmented generation. So what we're going to do is you have a database of content. And the content we're going to use for this example is the health systems website. So the website, uh, in their case, is like 7,500 web pages. And essentially, we want to pull out the sections of the website that talk about parking. So the way that's done is each web page is turned into a bunch of numbers, which is called an embedding. So it's a list of numbers that represent the essence of that page. And then what you do is you create an embedding of the question itself as another set of numbers. And the way these numbers work, these vector embeddings, is the vectors that are closest to each other, and you can think about this like in math, the distance between two points, the vectors that are closest to each other have the same kind of essence. They're talking about the same things. So essentially, you have this embedding for the question, and you have all the embeddings for the website, and you take the four embeddings, in my case, or the four web pages that have the closest vector to the question. So these would presumably be four web pages that talk about parking. You take the text of those web pages, and you stick it here, inside the prompt, and you basically say, okay, here are your instructions. Please use this content when answering the patient's question, and here is the patient question, and you send that whole bundle to the large language model, and then it should do a better job answering the patient's question. So now let's jump back into the code, and I'll show you how that all gets put together, and you can see it in action. So um, here what we want to do is we're going to pretend we're a health system, uh, and we want to answer patient questions. Uh, in this case, I took the entire website of this local health system in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Cambridge Health Alliance, um, and I downloaded it, so in advance of this uh, video, and I put it in this um, CSV file. So let me show you what that looks like. Where is it? Input web page text. Um... Actually, I'll show it in Excel. Uh, it's a little hard to see because it's wrapping around. Let me make the cells bigger. Um, but every page of the site gets a different uh, cell, uh, and it just has the text of the page. 
Okay, so some pages are small. Some pages have more information in it. Uh, COVID guidelines, um, you know, independent review of some event, uh, how to contact uh, CHA is Cambridge Health Alliance, that sort of uh, that sort of thing. So, um, so there's a there's a seven thousand page or seven thousand line CSV file basically that has all the text from this uh, relatively small uh, uh, website, but big enough, uh, big enough to make it interesting. Uh, and we want to answer patient questions. The example question I have is, do you have parking? Okay. So, um, so you have all these seven thousand pages. Let me show you that it's seven thousand. Or recall, yes, yeah, seventy five oh nine pages. Um, and what we want to do, and it's all in this little database, basically a CSV file. We want to add a second column with the embeddings. So this is taking each text page uh, and creating a, a vector embedding that kind of represents the essence of that text. So this is the little function that does that by calling uh, GPT-3, basically GPT-3 small. Call this just a little embedding model from the same group. Uh, open AI group. So that's a little function that a given text, it'll return an embedding. And for example, uh, this is taking the very first line of text here uh, in this table, and it's getting an embedding for that text. You can see it's relatively fast. And you can see this embedding is huge. I forget the length uh, of it, actually, I can tell you if you're interested. Um, the length of this particular embedding model is 1,536 floats. Uh, numbers. So that essentially represents the essence of that first uh, line of text. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, um, I'm just testing things, get the embedding for five lines here, and... This is the embedding for the first five. This takes um, uh, under a second, but nevertheless, since there's 7,000 of them, it takes a while to get all the embeddings. So what I did, I'm not going to run this cell, um, but what this cell does is on every single row, it applies the get embedding function and puts the output in this column called embeddings. Okay? So I have done that. I have saved it twice, actually a CSV file. So we can look at, um, and then a pickle file, which is a little bit, a uh, little bit faster. Uh, let's take a look at it. Actually, uh, no, no pickles. Website with embeddings open. Uh, this is a substantially bigger file. These embeddings actually are larger than the text itself. So uh, here you have that first thing of text. Uh, oops. Move that column over. And this is the embeddings. This is that very long number. So you have kind of two columns. Each column is the, the first column is the text and the second column is the embedding. Let me show you. Okay. So if I read back in the file and show you it, you can see there's the text and now we have a second column with the embedding. Okay. So now basically we want to, we want to ask ask our question essentially. So we want to get the embedding for the question. Uh, let me get this new question. Uh, new question is, do you have parking? So I'm going to get the embedding for that question. Do you have parking? And this is the first 10 um, floats of that 1500 uh, um, number embedding. Uh, and so now we want to compare each of the pages to the question embedding and find the four closest ones. Um, the way you can calculate the closest one is the dot product of those two vectors. Basically, and this is a little function from one of the libraries that computes the dot product between the embedding on each row and the question embedding, and then adds that as a distance column into the um, data frame. It's called the um, uh, this little database. So now you have the text, you have the embedding corresponding to that text, and then you have the distance from this embedding to the question embedding. Okay? And um, for the distance, probably not the right uh, term here, but I typed it anyway. Uh, for dot product, which is a version of the distance formula, you want the largest value. The largest value is the closest. 
So you can see here, uh, just by eyesight, you can see that ones on the top here, I've sorted this. Uh, you can see the word parking a lot, public transportation, subtle for blah, blah, blah. And you can see the ones on the bottom, that's the way this display works, um, are not about parking or uh, not in English. A few of those uh, you can see. So these are the ones that are farthest, uh, farthest away. So what we want to do is take the top four, which I'm doing here, the text of the top four, and we'll just concatenate that together. So if I do that, you can see that the top four is a bunch of things about parking. Main entrance, free parking lot, public transportation, plan your trip, blah, blah, blah. So you can see you have um, four web pages there or content from web pages that are all about parking. So now what we can do is include that as context. So this kind of completes this rag uh, approach. So now we have an instruction. You are an assistant helping the Cambridge Health Alliance respond to patient questions. When you answer the question, use the first person to refer to Cambridge Health Alliance. So I found that that's a nice instruction to give a natural answer. Then we're asking the question, uh, and then we're giving some context. Use this information from CHA's website as context to answer the question. And that context variable will be replaced by all this text up here. Please stick to this context when answering the question. Okay? So that basically um, completes the prompt before the prompt. We have instructions. We have some context that uh, GPT-3.5 Turbo should use to answer the question. Um, and then we have the question itself. So now it's asking the question, and we'll see how it did. Yes, we have parking at our facilities. Main entrance is on Revolution Drive in Somerville, across from the Home Depot, blah, blah, blah. So uh, parking costs, all that stuff. So see how helpful this answer ended up being, um, sort of chewing up essentially their whole website, but then a further, um, further analysis of these four pages that we sent it as context and as a nice readable answer. So that's the RAG uh, process. I'll just show you just a little bit uh, more to make it a little bit more repeatable. Now I just put everything into one function, which takes the question uh, and then returns the answer, basically by looking up, um, uh, you know, calculating the distance between that question and each of the embeddings, uh, finding the top four um, web pages uh, based on that distance. Um, joining those together into this context string, asking the question just like we did before, using that context uh, string in there, uh, and then returning the response. So, um, so that's a function that does it all in one step. So you can see, I'm going to run it again, undo you have parking, um, and um, it actually uh, just like these open AI models or any of these LLMs, it gives a different answer every time. There's a bit of randomness. Uh, in it, um, but another good answer. And then I'm just going to run everything below. I run selected cell and all below. Uh, these are just different questions um, that uh, I think are popular with uh, patients, depending on their situation. Do you offer addiction services? How do I prepare for my knee uh, surgery? I picked one of the physicians that was listed early uh, first on their website. Is she taking new patients? Do you take Blue Cross? Do you take Medicare? Is there somebody that speaks Spanish? What hospitals are you affiliated with? And how far in advance do I have to make appointments? So that's what it all looks like in code. I'll go back to the light board and just uh, finish up now. Okay, that was it. I hope that, uh, I hope that clarified how RAG really works at one level deeper than my last video. You can see it in code there. And it's not that complicated. That was about 30, 40 lines of code to put together this whole system, obviously leveraging a lot of code behind a large language model, but just putting together your content, this stitching together in a RAG system, uh, like I've talked about, and then leveraging a large language model, you can really create powerful software uh, without a lot of effort, uh, frankly, just, just pulling these pieces together. So that was it. Hope that was useful. And uh, until next time, bye.